Hello everyone, I'm Don Jaikori. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about to-dos and what not to-dos in service mesh architectures. As you may already be aware, service mesh is one of the hot topics in the container networking and Kubernetes in general right now. And I'm going to talk into different aspects of the service mesh, starting off with why a service mesh, how we got here, and what are the reasons that we decided to put a service mesh on top of already completed networking infrastructure. And then we'll look at what is a service mesh, all the technical aspect, architectural aspects about it, briefly touch upon traffic flows of the service mesh and all those things, and including the components. And then we'll end off with taking a look at to-dos and what not to-dos, you know, what are the considerations around service mesh infrastructures that you can think of, that you can take into account when you are implementing as well as if you are operationalizing service mesh infrastructures. Let's talk about how we got here for a minute. We had a monolithic architectures back then and we decided to break apart that monolith architecture and decided to introduce this microservices based infrastructure, right? Now the issue with having these microservices is you know now you have many of them and to make any sense out of these microservices you need to make sure effective communication between these many microservices right now make matters worse organizations were building up these microservices not in a really a cookie cutter way in a very different ways right to start off they were developing these microservices using different languages they were deploying these microservices using different build patterns build pipelines so all these things have made matters much more worse and this actually resulted in much more complexity, unnecessary complexity and obviously in the innovation, right? And that is not what we were wanted to get out of with the microservice infrastructure. And that's why we actually start break apart the monolith in the first place, right? Looking at the use cases of the service mesh infrastructure, right? In the next slide, I'm highlighting three main use cases that always come up as the main drivers for the service mesh infrastructure. First one is being the reliability, right? Reliability across communication between these services, right? Making sure the services are connected properly and services are able to reliably discover each other properly. All these are main drivers for service mesh adoption, right? And for the, for the along the line, the traffic handling behavior, right? For example, let's say you want to reroute the traffic, right? This uh, intelligently route traffic is one of the primary needs in an application environment, right? For example, let's say you have a service and you are trying to bring up a new version of that service. Now your use case is where you wanted to intelligently route, like let's say 95% of the current traffic should go to the, the current service, the old service, and 5% of the traffic should go to this new service. This kind of you know canary deployment, people want to make sure uh, we are able to correctly route traffic in between these services properly. So this reliable connectivity is one of the main drivers for service mesh uh, introductions. And the second one uh, is the security, right? You have many microservices in, in your infrastructure compared to the old monolithic architecture. Now obviously your attack vector in a certain way has gone up, right? You have many more endpoints, many more services that are talking with each other and you want to make sure that this communication it happened in a much more uh, in much more um, secure way right you want to encrypt the traffic between between these services right right next to the services if that if at all possible right not not after a couple hops if you can you know encrypt it right next to the services so this kind of encrypting capabilities right and and furthermore you want to make sure that you can actually do security policies from a much more centralized fashion right these kind of use cases, security use cases, were another primary driver for service mesh adoption. And last but not the least, observability. Right. It is true that you know we are losing certain amount of visibility, and not necessarily losing; it's just getting much more complicated, right? So increased visibility is always a plus sign in this complex infrastructure, right? Now the the, the use case is where you want to increase visibility at the same time you want to you want to be able to get a lot more contextual awareness to all these traffic patterns right so you want to be able to gain a lot of understanding of how the traffic is working so if there's an entity that you can provide all these all these uh, tracing data and all these heuristic data that would be great right so that was one of the primary drivers for the service mesh infrastructure 
Now let's take a pause for a minute, right? Because if you really look at it, none of these use cases are new, right? Because you know we always have the need for better traffic handling. We always want security and we always need uh, better visibility and better observability mechanisms, right? So none of these use cases are inherently new to the container infrastructure or, you know, we always have this need uh, in previous architectures, right? So if you really look at the evolution of these these service mesh use cases, right? It's pretty interesting. If you take a look at like pre-2015, right, pre-Kubernetes area, um, we were deploying these services on top of, you know, different platforms, right? Like VMs, bare metal, OpenStack, whatnot, right? And the services goes on top of it. And most of these use cases, right? Traffic use cases like circuit breaking, routing, service discovery, all those things, including security use cases such as authentication, observability use cases like tracing, all these things were more or less getting embedded into the services, right? In this so-called middleware layer, right? Now, fast forward into 2020, what's happening is, right, what's already starting to happen is, this middleware layer is kind of getting disappeared, right? This, this tight coupling of this middleware layer to the service is getting, you know, abandoned for, for a number of good reasons. Now, services getting, are getting much more loosely coupled with each other and that service mesh layer is going to take care of that middleware layer, right? So, so operationally speaking, this is pretty good news, right? Because developers can go about their way of writing their service applications and adding value to the businesses, right? And operation organizations can take care of all the other use cases to make sure that operationally all these services are getting deployed in a proper mechanism and you have much more granular control of this service infrastructure as a result, right? From the traffic handling point of view, from the security point of view, as well as observability point of view, right? So that's the primary driver for the service mesh. So that, that middleware layer that we used to see back in the day is kind of getting absorbed to the service mesh infrastructure now. Uh, with the with this with the much more loosely coupled service infrastructure so as a result you know uh, both the development and of there's a clear boundary between development as well as the uh, operations organizations of enterprises right so what is the current state of the service mesh right so um, it started with the linkage and Istio was not far behind now fast forward it to 2020 mid 2020 now right so we have so many solutions to pick from right so this is this is frankly it's pretty good news right if you look at like the the people that who are actually bringing service measures right they can you can kind of you know quickly fill out the buckets right like the big cloud providers right aws app mesh uh, google anthos right azure engineers have their own open service mesh right uh pass providers like vmware tanzu right um, all these are you know they are they are already solving some of their unique use cases with the service measure with their own service measures right uh, middleware companies like MuleSoft have their anypoint service mesh right and and third party providers like hashicorp right for example hashicorp has console right so which is pretty popular in the in the arena as well uh, so everyone is solving their own unique use cases so which means you know there are plenty of use cases and problems to pick from right that's this is all that it's saying from this graph right here right um, basically you know it's pretty good news in the sense that you know uh, there are plenty of use cases plenty of problems and at the same time you know you might actually have might have trouble evaluating all these services but you know uh, they are pretty unique to be honest right like people are focusing on some some of some of the folks are not just focusing on the container environment right because at the, at the end of the day, traffic has to shuffle through everywhere, right? You are not going to leave behind your legacy infrastructure. So one of the prominent use cases that are coming up is, you know, how to how to make sure that, you know, you are not leaving the VM environment behind with the service mesh architectures, right? So some of these uh, service meshes like Kuma, for example, are mostly focusing on, on bringing in like traditional uh, VM environment uh, into the picture as well right so so everyone has their unique spin on the service mesh and the architecture and where is going but from the data plane point of view i definitely see that you know most people are uh, are getting uh, converged on the envoy proxy layer i'll cover a little bit more depth on that in the further slides on the what what is a service mesh uh, talk right um, in, the, in that section but but in a high level right most of these 
these these guys are offering like a unique spin on the control plane right some some folks are um, extending istio control plane but uh, then the others are have their own control plane but for the most for the most part the data plane is you know getting uh, getting uniquely clubbed uh, uniquely clubbed together with the envoy proxy okay let's move on to the what's a service mesh portion of my talk right so let's start by looking at you know the architecture of the service meshes right so in a very high level if you look at it service mesh is nothing but an abstracted architecture pattern right there is a control plane and there's a data plane right so in the control plane right control plane exposes set of apis and as users we can interact with that apis and instruct the control plane to put all these you know use case policies that we were talking about earlier right from a traffic handling point of view you can say this service this service traffic is going to be directed in this manner right the security policies and uh, observational observability rules and so on and so forth so all these are getting directed through the control plane and then there's this data plane the proxies live right next to your applications or the services right so the placement of the proxies we'll talk about in a second but in a generally speaking it sits right next to your service and app right and it's the connection is getting terminated right on that proxy itself so what this means is from the data plane point of view all your communication is getting terminated outside world only knows about this particular proxy and proxy is doing proxying for that that service that is sitting on top right so um, so as a result so the control plane actually instructs the proxy to enforce those policies that you define through that control plane api and then the data plane proxy is handling the all the data plane functionality so for all the hype it's for the service mesh it's a pretty straightforward architectural pattern right it's nothing more than more than bunch of uh, user space user space proxies stuck next to the service or app right um, where is it stuck we'll talk about it later but uh, it actually referred to as a service which is data plane and then you have the control plane right which actually um, data plane inter intercepts this request from the control plane and it does stuff right and the control plane coordinates the behavior of the proxies and all that with an api and as a user you interact with that service mesh control plane using that api so where should this proxy actually lives right so this is something we talk about briefly touch upon right if you really look at the placement of the proxy right i was showing right alongside the application but that's not necessarily true right in the next slide if you move on you will see like three different options where we can actually put this uh, proxy on right in the first option we can embed this proxy as a library into the application the apparent downside is right now you have to depend on your developers to get this proxy and embedded into the applications right so that's not necessarily why we started out this whole microservices service mesh journey in the first place right like you are coupling you are tightly coupling more with your other teams right so number one option number one is not necessarily good in the option number two what i'm showing is right we have the you have a proxy per node per kubernetes node right so this is this is cool in a way that you know you don't have to deal with like uh, multiple proxies in this case right you just have a one guy sitting on a per node basis and all the applications all your kubernetes services get proxied from there and it's a much more simpler model the drawback of this drawback is you know it's a single point of failure at this point i will cover all these things uh, i'll touch up on this subject later as well in the do's and don'ts section uh, but but then again you know it's it's pretty obvious that it's a single point of failure so now that means you know you have to deploy you know two three proxies per node with that that's good or not right so so this is up to the debate right now as well and then the third option is the sidecar option right um uh, sidecar option in this case what happens is your proxy is getting embedded in right next to the application so if you recall from your kubernetes 101 right um if you see a kubernetes pod that's getting deployed kubernetes is pod is nothing nothing but a bunch of containers that's sitting on a same network namespace so what's happening is uh, we are actually em embedding one of the proxies as another container into the same kubernetes pod so as a result that proxy has uh, is sitting right alongside with the same network namespace as your application service container uh, 
so as a result it has it, it will inherit all the networking parameters from the application so so this is what we call a sidecar container uh, and that is that proxy is getting embedded into the same pod or same network namespace as your application right alongside now if you look at the common most common deployment patterns today the sidecar is definitely winning by a margin right now uh, people do like this aspect of you know sharing the same namespace network namespace alongside the actual kubernetes service uh, service itself so that you know it it uh, it actually sits right alongside with the application and that's pretty good from the security point of view as well because uh, proxy is right there there's it's not going to cross any boundaries so if you if you implement security policies or if you implement like encryption such as tls your tier your connection connection is going to get right almost right down to the network namespace of that application so so that sidecar proxy is getting a lot more uh, a uh, lot more uh, uh, eyeballs rolling these days and most of the implementation that are actually using the sidecar proxy. So actually talking about proxies, you cannot really talk about proxies without talking about Envoy, right? Envoy has pretty much become the universal data plane for all the Microsoft, Microsoft microservices, Kubernetes architectures today, right? It is it is the most prominent proxies being used pretty much, you know, you know by a wide margin if I had to guess, right? Uh, one of the reason is being when it came out of Lyft, you know, it was really focusing on the performance aspect of it, right? Like this data handling, data shuffling back and forth, right? It actually uses a high performance C++ library and that was a, one of the key differentiators. But but more importantly, it actually provided a lot of observability and you know advanced load balancing functionality. But most importantly, there is one reason that in, that why and why it really got popular because of the declarative style API that actually it allowed very similar to the Kubernetes style, right? Uh, Nginx and HA proxy was there, and other proxies were there, but but this declarative style API actually allowed. Envoy to get really popular among developers because now you suddenly get these uh, APIs that you can actually program against and using the XDS protocol that's the con configuration language of Envoy right using this XDS protocol as users you can now really decouple that control plane from the data plane so so this decoupling of this whole control plane idea was pretty much you know very popular uh, got really popular with the with the Envoy itself so compared to the data plane we did have a universal choice for uh, for the uh, with the envoy uh, when it comes to the control plane we don't have the choice and that's exactly the point right that's why we do have many different uh, service mesh architectures because the control plane is different everyone is implementing the service mesh in a different different ways and attacking different use cases so one of the example popular examples is istio and um, uh, is the you know there's the pilot component where it actually is the control plane component that that uh, that responsible of pushing the generating the configuration uh, accepting the user configuration generating it and you know streaming it down to these envoy proxies and this is you know you can see this kind of equivalent architectures around other uh, uh, service mesh control planes as well um, yeah and then um, uh, with that, you know, I'm not going to go that much detail into a particular control plane because everyone is different from that angle, right? So with that, let's take a look at, you know, what are the do's and don'ts of the service mesh infrastructure because uh, whether you are planning it out or whether you are already in the POC process or trying it out here and there or even you are all the way, you know, ahead of the curve and, you know, get, getting a service mesh deployed. There are certain considerations that you might want to take a look at, and let's go ahead and take a look at those uh, considerations. To start off, right, um, do you really need a service mesh? Right? That's actually a question, very valid question that you should ask, especially if you are if you are trying to figure it out, you know, whether to put it or not, uh, service mesh on top of your infrastructure. Uh, Buoyant, the maker of the Linkerd, actually has this. Uh, specific question I have very interesting question I on their website if you haven't taken a look at it uh, I urge you to go and take a look at it there are interesting questions like you know how many people are you in, in your engineering org uh, how many microservices are there in your application right because at the end of the day like I was mentioning service mesh is nothing but another abstraction layer on top of it right and like any abstractions it does have its trade-offs right you know uh, uh, the, you know there you if you don't have 
that many microservices to take care of it might not be worthwhile to you know put this uh, another abstraction layer on top of it right your general cni networking uh, layer that that uh, that does the packet forwarding might be enough right or you may want to take a look at a specific uh, service mesh infrastructure right like uh, uh, so there are certain things that you have to worry about right another aspect of the uh, questions that they are probing is you know whether do you have any uh, all, all your services written in a certain language right or you have more of like a polyglot kind of environment where most of your services are written in different different languages right if you keep in, inheriting different languages different teams in your infrastructure right the service mesh might be a very valuable proposition for you right so so you need to be very aware of these kind of you know questions before you start going and evaluating a service mesh because again you know it might not be for everyone it might it might it may be a fantastic solution for you but you just need to be aware of these these conditions now moving forward uh, another consideration that you have to really look at is you know you have to really pay attention to your application architecture right we keep saying you you are we are assuming we are by default we are assuming that you are actually uh, s s splitting your you know micro uh, your monolith into microservices but but are they really you know loosely coupled right that's one of the one of the primary considerations that you have to primary you know uh, primary things that you have to worry about right if your services are not really loosely coupled with each other it might not be a good idea to put a service mesh because uh, and, and not just from the technical point of view as well as you know your organization structure point of view right if you have clear structure boundaries between your services to your to your organization uh, structures right your departments for say for, for example right it may be a very good plus point to put a service mesh right because everything is decoupled everything is very loosely coupled right you you even from even from the from the deployment angle so uh, so that's a, another plus point right so um, but but then again you know you one of the key things not just from the application architecture point of view even from the deployment point of view right what I meant from the deployment is you know for example let's say you have 100 microservices right you, uh, you but you cert suddenly you have you're figuring out you know you have dependency between you know service X to service Y right not not in terms of you know the service uh, boundaries but in terms of the deployment right the service y is expecting service x is already there to uh, they, they are in the deployment cycle right ahead of the pipeline right this kind of deployment gotchas might actually cause unnecessary problems when you try to put a service mesh on top of it right so so again bottom line is you know you should be free of i wouldn't call it free of dependencies but you should be almost free of these kind of gotcha dependencies if you seriously considering a service mesh infrastructure because if you don't then you may actually run into big problems down the line so another popular consideration that you actually pay really really big attention to is the resource utilization right and i mean you're not going to get a service mesh without a zero cost to you right there is there is pretty pretty apparent you know resource constraints that you should be aware of right and you can kind of you know divide that into control plane uh, related issues and the data plane right in the control plane uh, things like you know your rate of deployment and configuration changes may you know if you if, you, if you're planning on doing a lot of configuration changes you know that is gonna really tax the whole system a whole lot right and um, you know the scale of the system right the number of proxies that actually connect in you know, number of envoy proxies that are connecting the uh, control plane is significantly play uh, play into the pic, uh, the resource consumption picture right in terms of the data plane you know um, this the, the usual suspects right your protocol your cpu cores you know uh, number of threads that you have right the number of client connections that these proxies are making all these things will play into picture um, in terms of the resource con considerations just to throw out some numbers right um, so uh, istio actually has very uh, very comprehensive list of uh, um, scalability numbers in here so just to uh, and is still using envoy so I, I I would expect that you know the numbers would be uh, if not similar it would be in the same ballpark for most of other service meshes but obviously you know you need to kind of you know uh, go and verify with the service mesh of your choice but in terms of istio the numbers are you know if you have like a thousand services in a 2000 sidecar with a 70k mesh request 
then you know you are you're talking about um envoy proxy might add like around um, 2 to 3 millisecond of latency per hop right that's in the 90th percentile and that's the number that they came up with in this in this particular cluster and you can kind of take a look at all these granular numbers in this your performance documents and there are like couple good uh, twitter threads as well so i'm pointing uh, putting a link out to carl stoney's twitter thread um, uh, in, in his uh, his i think he's working for auto trader so there he's he's describing an environment where you know 650 virtual services 420 480 rules with the mtls enabled and uh, telemetry v2 with this new assistio version uh, the performance numbers that he's getting so it's worthwhile taking a look at but at the end of the day you know just be aware that you know you are going to pay for your service mesh because at the end of the day you know uh, it is going to utilize uh, resources from the latency uh, point of view as well as uh, from the cpu and memory point of view as well so another popular operational consideration that you take care of is upgrades, right? Um, again, you know, you're putting abstraction on top of it, so better plan it ahead, right? You have to re read your upgrade nodes you know, according to your particular releases, release nodes and so on. But uh, avoid, you know, general rule of thumb is, you know, avoid all these in-place upgrades, right? Uh, there, There is certain settings on some of the service meshes that you can actually uh, reduce the disruptions to the active services by using like canary deployment for example you can spawn your new control plane the version 2 of the new version control plane somewhere else and you know uh, gradually move the services to that new control plane while keeping the existing control plane intact so so be aware of all these upgrade mechanisms uh, when you're doing uh, service mesh upgrades and you know plan ahead uh, another popular consideration is DR, right? Um, this is uh, very, very much, I mean, th at its infancy to say the least, right? Uh, you still need to, you know, to monitor the space very closely. There are a couple ways, right? You know, um, you can have a single cluster in a single service mesh. You can have a multi-cluster so in, a, in, a, in a one mesh or, you know, you can go uh, go into multi-cluster multi-mesh like the whole utopia mode over here right so uh, so these are a little bit you know um, I, I would not uh, i have not seen that many significant developments around there but you know there are a lot of active conversations but be aware of uh, all the dr considerations as well now another popular consideration point that you want, want to consider is the SMI, the service mesh interface that's coming up, right? Um, the idea of behind this SMI is, you know, having a standardized interface for a service mesh in the Kubernetes. So all your service mesh like Istio, Linkerd, Console, all these service mesh will be a provider to this API and, you know, this service mesh interface will kind of abstract out like dependencies on this provider level. So, so consider this as you know abstraction on top of an abstraction right so uh, why do we need that right uh, why do we need to put in this kind of abstraction and abstraction because you know it might be actually makes sense you know if you're building a tooling on top of a service mesh SMI might be a pretty good uh, alternative for you right you might want to consider it because you know you want to be transparent to the underlying provider service mesh at the same time you know your tooling you don't want to rewrite your tooling right so SMI that's the idea of SMI uh, it's still pretty new but uh, but it's a, it's an evolving subject in there right now around the ongoing developments there are a lot of things are happening around the sidecar a lot of people are working on it proxy placement is almost a done deal you know sidecar almost have one but you know there are certain certain pros and cons in that environment right you know sidecars are a little bit harder to handle when it comes to upgrades right so people are wondering about per node proxies right then again you know all these concerns that i mentioned earlier might come up right cilium is, is working on accelerating you know sidecars you know they they have they have multiple presentations around that Google has this interesting concept of traffic director where, you know, the control plane of the service mesh is completely outside of the cluster. So these are like a bunch of the things that you, that, that happening and, you know, bottom line is you have to be aware of these ongoing developments. It's a very much of a very um, fluent field right now. So I hope this presentation gave you some idea about what's happening and, you know, basics underlying what to do and what to not to do about this service mesh infrastructure. And uh, thank you for watching.
All right. Thanks, Don. Um, let's just see if you have any questions come in during this time. 